Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Melanoma Research Foundation's Ask the Expert series. My name is Eric Kraus, and I'm the Education Associate here at the MRF. We are thrilled to have you join us today for this wonderful educational opportunity entitled Fear of Recurrence and Scanxiety. Our mission at the MRF is to eradicate melanoma by funding research to find a cure while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. Education is critical for, for patients making informed decisions about their care. We are grateful to ESI for their generous support of today's webinar and investment in the MRF's mission. ESI is fueled by their human health care mission, which is guided by a simple principle. Patients and their families come first, and they have a responsibility to listen and learn from them. ESI shares the MRF's belief that informed patients are empowered patients. A brief disclaimer before we get started. We encourage you to use the Q&A box to ask questions throughout the session. The information presented during today's session is for educational purposes and any, any individual questions should be directed to your healthcare team. We encourage everyone to visit melanoma.org to learn more about the resources we have available. Also, this session will be available after as a part of our video library that you can share with others. Today, we are joined by an amazing panel to help us understand and navigate emotions that are common after a melanoma diagnosis specifically surrounding recurrence and scanxiety. While everyone's specific situation will be different, it can be helpful to hear from others who understand the experience. Each panelist participating in today's webinar is an expert in the patient experience and navigating fears, anxieties, and other emotions that may arise during a journey with cancer. And the MRF is proud to partner with them to provide additional support to our melanoma community. Our first speaker is Karen, the Senior Director at the Patient Navigator I'm sorry, Senior Director and Patient Navigator of the Cancer Support Helpline. She joined Cancer Support Community in October of 2019. She has 30 years of oncology experience as a, as a social worker and practice administrator in university healthcare settings, as well as patient services, fundraising, and programs development in the nonprofit cancer advocacy space. At CSC, Karen provides clinical oversight of the Cancer Support Helpline and coordinates navigation services for patients and caregivers. Karen's full bio can be found on our learning platform. Thanks for joining us, Karen. I'm going to pull my slides up for a quick moment. All right. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Okay, perfect. Thank okay, getting started here. I was asked to talk a bit about scanxiety, and um, just generally speaking, so that we can all level set, uh, scanxiety is thought to be um, defined as that pervasive worry uh, when a cancer-related test is ordered, or even while we're waiting for that test to occur, um, during, during that test, that test. Um, or also while you're waiting for the results. So that really um, kind of an intense worry and concern. Most anyone who's dealt with a cancer diagnosis has this fear, as well as the worry that their cancer may recur. So we plan to address this tonight during the webinar and also hopefully to assist patients, survivors, and caregivers in coping with this very widely spread um, experience um, by almost everyone phenomenon. Okay. So first, let's take a couple minutes to consider how cancer uh, creates change. A diagnosis of melanoma um, creates changes in all kinds of uh, aspects of, lot, of our lives. Uh, all of us cope with changes in our daily life for sure, yet a cancer diagnosis can have a tendency to change many aspects all at once, and this can create heightened emotions for sure. Um, the physical, the emotional work, I'm sure you can think of a bunch of other areas in which a cancer diagnosis kind of wreaks havoc and creates change that can make us um, uncertain. At the cancer support community, we have a research and training institute, and part of what they do is gather data and present it to really amplify the patient experience. And they do this through thousands of surveys every year. Um, and they ask key questions about the patient experience. And um, this slide here really shows that 
almost half of patients that are diagnosed with a cancer are at risk for significant levels of anxiety. I mean, this is more than, um, you know, the scan related anxiety. I'm talking uh, anxiety and at risk for even an anxiety disorder if it's not uh, treated or addressed. So I feel like um, these other statistics are important, but this first bullet here I felt like was important to our conversation. Um, in this webinar. We also at Cancer Support Community look at disease site specific um, registries. So we take in information. For instance, this uh, slide right here shows you some key facts learned from my melanoma uh, patients and caregivers. And here it shows that 56% of those um, surveyed on the melanoma survey were at risk for anxiety at a significant level. And this last slide um, from our survey just really shows some of those related concerns um, in uh, the melanoma survey. Um, just to focus in on one in particular that I'm pretty sure a lot of people can relate to, that is that 64% reported a moderate or serious concern about health insurance or money worries. Uh, at Cancer Support Community, we hear from a lot of people that that's their main, um, the driving factor of their anxiety is, all right, I have all these changes, I have a plan in place to address the, the cancer diagnosis, and yet my finances are, are very at risk here, and that creates feelings of anxiety. So this is an example of um, how Cancer Support Community gleans the most important issues, and then we go in and create programs around these concerns. All right, so we know many experiences of high anxiety are related to some of these universals. So I'll just very quickly go through them. Um, certainly a cancer diagnosis can make us feel like we are the only ones dealing with this. It creates an unwanted aloneness um, that can contribute to emotional um, responses, whether it be anxiety or depression or distress of some kind. Um, again, I mentioned the financial burden already, and, and that's related to things um, as, you know, as a you know, front line as I don't have health insurance all the way to I don't have money to keep my children in the activities um, that they were once doing because I'm paying high copays for medications, et cetera. Um, so it's the full gamut. Um, some people do experience uh, feelings of loss of hope or loss of control. And, um, you know, that living with uncertainty, again, is a universal that really contributes to some of these emotional um, responses to a diagnosis. But these are common, right? So it's, it's not to say we shouldn't address them, but also I think it's important, especially when people do feel isolated or alone, to say this, that these worries are quote unquote, normal reactions to this roller coaster of an experience with cancer. Um, I would like to talk about three very um, quick high level descriptions of the mental health impacts of a cancer diagnosis that we tend to talk about a lot on the helpline. So I think it's important to mention these and, um, and you can of course, um, think of questions that you want to add in later um, about these. So cancer distress is um, a mix of anxiety and depressive symptoms that a lot of people experience. In fact, most people with cancer have an experience of distress at one point or another in their diagnosis, for sure. Um, this can cause sleeplessness, lack of appetite, difficulty concentrating, um, difficulty carrying on your regular life activities. And although some distress is normal, about a third of cancer patients experience significant um, distress. And um, I think it's also important to note that only about 5% of people with cancer that have this level of distress even get um, or seek uh, psychological help with this. So while, to, you know, we can't say distress, we can't connect it to the cancer diagnosis directly, it can affect how we cope 
with a cancer diagnosis. And it can help, um, it can hinder rather, our ability to follow treatment recommendations and go along with the program, be actively engaged in our care. So anxiety um, and fear are also common reactions to life experiences like cancer. And about half of cancer patients say they have some sort of anxiety. Um, and here this um, data really talks about this extreme um, anxiety or protracted course of anxiety that can occur with some people um, can lead to an anxiety disorder. And that's why it's so important to do some of the, um, the strategies that we'll talk about in a minute because left untreated or unaddressed, um, it can become more serious than just a common reaction to um, a cancer diagnosis. So scanxiety is that very specific, um, you know, in the literature. Again, we opened the session up with a definition, but just to touch on it again, it can really be hooked into that fear of recurrence, but specifically where a trigger might be a scan that's scheduled, your doctor may say to you, hey, I think I need to get another scan to see how your treatment um, has affected the cancer so far. And just the idea of having to schedule that test can be anxiety provoking. In addition, sitting through an MRI or waiting for the results. I think a lot of people say that's actually the worst part is waiting for the results. Um, but even translating the results, this can be very fraught. Um, a very anxiety fraught time. And so the phrase cancity has really been coined to describe that very specific experience. I will tell you, um, and what's interesting to me is how that um, diagnosis of um, scanxiety, my slides advanced, but real quick, um, that has prompted a lot of articles, um, webcasts, um, podcasts, excuse me, webinars, and even local support groups and cancer centers focus just in on scanxiety, which I think is great because if you can recognize this and um, put some tools in place, you can sort of mitigate some of that distress that's felt by those tests. So I encourage you to seek out any um, information specifically on that. Now, just quickly mentioning depression because anxiety and depression sometimes do go hand in hand. Um, we see that 15 to 25% of people with cancer will experience depression at one point or another. And it can um, be said to affect cancer patients um, and even caregivers at a bit more of a risk, um, times two to three times more than the general population and that it happens for um, men and women. And this is really that um, sadness and um, feeling of maybe hopelessness that can come with. You know, some treatments also mimic feelings of anxiety and depression. Um, some treatments can create fatigue or an anxious feeling. So that should be said too, that something you can always address with your oncologist or um, nurse practitioner in your local practice. Um, but I will say that most of these emotions we're discussing will ebb and flow and maybe even fade over time as you get a little bit more secure and adjusted to some of your treatments and um, the information that's been given. Um, but sometimes uh, cancer can be pervasive, um, excuse me, depression can be pervasive and definitely worth um, reaching out for support. There's a lot of data on specific counseling techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy. These are amazing strategies that a therapist can employ with someone who has cancer to really help reframe some of the thoughts um, that you may have um, and sort of refocus and channel energies in a way that is able to help you um, you know, move forward and enjoy life in the context of a cancer experience. And that is not to say it's not work to get there. It certainly is. But these, um, these strategies here are um, available to most people and the helpline and cancer support community um, does a nice job at connecting people to resources like this. So I will click through.
also to say there's also a lot of what ifs when it comes to a cancer diagnosis and living with a cancer, even supporting someone with cancer. So um, we offer fact sheets on coping with uncertainty as well. And so for time's sake, I'll inter invite you to take a look at Cancer Support Community's website on that topic if you wish. Um, I wanted to interject a little piece here about positive thinking when we're talking about fears and anxieties. Um, people around us want us to do okay. And I think a lot of people will offer, you know, that advice. It's just, you have to think positively and you just have to be um, bright and, and um, not think negatively and you'll do well. And um, there's a nurse scholar, um, Jimmy Holland, um, was her name? She was out of Memorial Sloan Kettering and has really done a huge amount of work in this area. And her quote here, I think, is worth taking a look at. And it's bad enough to have cancer, but when all of your family and friends are saying, all you have to do is be positive and you just have to fight this thing and you have to beat it and you have to be a survivor and um, you have to battle all of these phrases. It seemed, it seemed to Jimmy that this just adds an additional burden and even in her words can be ridiculous. So let's think about how positive thinking, the idea of that can be a burden to someone with a cancer diagnosis. Um, because attitudes about cancer, especially um, coming from, you know, very well-meaning supporters, they may not realize that this is even a burden. So giving you an idea about why um, this feels burdensome maybe can uh, aid in communication when this type of thing arises in, in your experience. But when you think about it, um, when someone says just be positive, it sort of creates this, well, um, now I'm not able to acknowledge cancer is actually difficult and frightening to me. Um, and that feels like something I wanted to share. Also, this insistence that you put on a happy face is kind of like exhausting. Um, it, it, it definitely could rob someone going through treatment or waiting for test results, could rob you of the energy um, that you kind of need to get through um, by, you know, trying so hard to, to appear okay for everyone. Um, also, some people will say, I, there must be something wrong with me because I can't stay positive. And is that going to affect my survival? And they may feel guilty that they're not able to maintain. Um, and also, um, you know, the idea that emotion, expressing emotion isn't acceptable in our society, that's sort of fading away, I think. But that positive thinking mantra, that kind of gets at that, where we're, we're thinking, oh, we're weak if we're emotional, which of course is not true. Instead, we should focus in on building what we like to call it CSC, an emotional first aid kit. And um, I won't go through each of these areas for time's sake, but really um, gathering your people and your resources and taking good care so that you're able to reframe thoughts and you're able to participate fully in treatment decisions is a pretty important aspect of cancer survivorship. And part of this really is recognizing resilience is an important, um, you know, strength. Rather than being positive all the time, building on our resilience is um, an area that you'll see a lot of, um, again, literature, webinars, and podcasts in the cancer space about resiliency. And it's not something we all just have. We're not all just born with it. We need to work on it. And so that's why it's super important to consider what we can do to build resilience. I'll give you a quick example. A lot of people find mindfulness, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's meditation or even just a quick moment where you're grounding yourself through the day, where you're drinking your coffee in the morning and, and kind of focusing in on one thing, that coffee in the morning, it's, that's my thing, and I'm really tuning everything out, throwing thoughts out the window at the moment to really take care of yourself and tap in and be mindful to build your resilience. Also creating a team. So another way that that first aid kit, it's to get your friends around your family and communicate about what you need. Um, and you don't necessarily need a positive attitude, but you might need someone to just hear you out once a week or maybe that night before you have that appointment just to be a shoulder for for getting that out and 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 you know, shoring up for the next day. Um, you also might want to look for support around 
Um, there's peer-to-peer -peer groups that take place now over the phone, and you could talk to somebody else who knows what it's like firsthand to deal with melanoma and the treatments and some of that uncertainty. You can call our helpline, and of course, MRF is, is here to help um, you know, with your building of resources and and your strengths and information. Um, we should, you know, say that if you're feeling extremely anxious about the future and you really can't flip that off or you feel so down that you're really not feeling like you can engage um, and be part of treatment decisions or even just your day-to-day -day life, it's very important to reach out to one of these professionals listed on the slide so that you can get connected to some additional support. Because just because these things exist, anxiety, depression, distress, doesn't mean that you have to live with them. These things are treatable. Okay, and again, if you feel severe worry, I feel like you're worrying more time than not. I think that's an important thing. Not great days, you know, where you just haven't had a good day in a row, you know, several in a row. Then you're you're wanting to tap into some supports, whether it's calling an organization or reaching out to your social worker, doctor, or nurse. Um, I mentioned the helpline a couple of times, and I just want to put it out there. That's where I'm from. Um, we're there to support everyone, and um, we refer to organizations like the Melanoma Research Foundation often. Uh, but we're here to hear your concerns and plug you into resources. We also have um, My Lifeline, which is a great platform to reach out to other people on discussion boards and also a way to keep your um, own uh, chosen curated group of supporters informed about how you're doing. So you can go to mylifeline.org and, and check that out as well. And I just want to say that um, above all else, the cancer support community does not want people to experience cancer alone. And that's why we're community. And um, we definitely invite people to reach out and, and get support and education. And again, I'm so grateful to be a part of this important panel. So thank you for the invitation and for your kind attention. Thank you, Karen. That was great. Um, Karen will join us again in a little while for our Q&A session at the end. Um, next, I would like to introduce our patient panel. This panel will have four melanoma survivors who will be able to speak to their experiences of navigating fears of recurrence and anxiety. Thank you, um, all of a, thank you to all of you for joining this evening. First, we have Jennifer Schultz. Jennifer is an educator, speaker, and writer with a background in digital marketing, social media management, and event planning. She received both her bachelor's and master's degrees from Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Currently, she teaches public speaking at her alma mater, serves on the athletics committee of their alumni advisory council, and works as an academic coach at Athletes Committed to Students. Jennifer is a four-time melanoma survivor. She is passionate about spreading melanoma awareness and educating her community on sun safety. She's a certified melanoma educator through the MRF and has built a community of other cancer survivors, thrivers, and warriors through her website, jenpatrice.com, and her podcast, Company You Keep. Next, we have Star Crutcher. Star lives in Middle Tennessee, where she works for a rural broadband communication provider to supply high-speed internet to underserved communities across Tennessee. She's a melanoma survivor who was first diagnosed in 2019 and is now passionate about educating others on sun safety and early detection. Next, we have Catherine Laffey. Catherine currently lives in West Palm Beach, where she has been a preschool teacher for over 10 years. She holds a bachelor's degree in child growth and development, and Catherine was uh, diagnosed with melanoma in March of 2022. Given her recent diagnosis, she is passionate about learning all she can about this cancer. She's very thankful for her support system of survivors who have helped educate her and support her journey. journey. Finally, we have Kelly Pittman. Kelly is a world-traveled actress, model, and international pageant title holder and makeup and spray tan artist. As a melanoma survivor, she is now dedicating herself and her work to the healing of the mind and body and the modalities of life coaching, writing, teaching of goddess yoga, and hosting wellness retreats. She currently lives in the Atlanta area with her three children and two dogs. All of our patients' full bios can be found on our learning platform. Welcome to our patient panel and thank you all for joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Thanks, Eric. So as Eric mentioned, I am a four-time melanoma survivor. I was first diagnosed in 
January of 2015. So as we're thinking about the new year, I don't recommend kicking it off that way. Um, I like to say that a college class that I took, um, a health class that I took in college probably saved my life because one thing is I don't think that there's enough education and awareness about melanoma and skin cancer in general out there. I definitely knew what it was, but didn't know the warning signs ahead of time. And I was randomly assigned skin cancer and melanoma for this health class. And so I learned about the ABCDEs, um, what to look for. And so fast forward a few years, I was living in Chicago and I kept noticing this mole on my shoulder as I was getting ready in the morning. And I didn't know what it was that bothered me about it, but I just had this gut feeling that it didn't look right. And um, the biggest thing is it was had irregular borders and wasn't symmetrical. So two of the main signs. And so I went in, uh, made a, an appointment with a dermatologist and I walked in and um, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, thank you for coming in and showing me this. And I was like, Oof, not a good sign. So um, it did come back as melanoma. Uh, luckily we found it early. I was stage 1B because I was 1B and they felt like it was growing pretty rapidly. I did have lymph nodes um, removed for testing and it hadn't spread. And the whole process of that, maybe from finding out that I had melanoma to my actual surgery to remove it went really fast. It was about 10 days and then it was over and I was on the other side and I was like, I hadn't even processed it. Didn't really even know what had just happened. And um, I'll get a little bit more into that later, but I made it to five years with no recurrence. Um, had a big party to celebrate five years cancer-free. I had had that marked on my calendar and was something I was really looking forward to celebrating. And that was January of 2020. So um, a lot of things were to come um, shortly after that January. But one of those was a couple of months later, um, I found out that I had a melanoma in situ. Again, the three-month skin checks that I was on were doing their job. We caught it early. And I was like, okay, the treatment plan is working. And then a handful of months later, I was back and I had another stage 1B and I was back in surgery um, within a 10-month span from April of 2021 to February of 2022, I had three melanoma recurrences. So that was definitely a big source of anxiety for me. And I guess that probably is what qualifies me as an expert on reoccurrence, something I can assure you that nobody wants to be. So at the beginning, I was talking about how everything went really fast and I hadn't had time to process it. And I actually had a lot of guilt originally, like, wow, my story, like I had it and it was gone and that was it. And I felt a lot of guilt and had trouble identifying as a survivor. But as I started going to those three month skin checks and they kept finding atypical moles, they kept taking biopsies, they kept removing things and having to do more surgeries. It was starting to weigh on me and it wasn't until about a year and a half after that first diagnosis, I was sitting at a stoplight in my hometown and I was like, oh, like I just, I felt very hopeless, which I know Karen had mentioned and I was like, I didn't see a light at the end of the tunnel and I was like, I just don't want to be here. And it like caught me off guard. I hadn't even realized I had hit that point. And I was like, that is not okay to think. And so my first step was to get help and um, to start talking to a therapist. I had so much fear going into those skin checks. There were times when my dermatologist would come in and say, you know, how are you doing today? And I would just burst into tears. And I can't believe no one asked, didn't like ask before, like, how are you really doing? Do you need to speak to somebody? And so those were the two biggest things. Almost when it came back, it was sort of that sense of relief. I had such a big fear of it coming back that obviously I would never want my melanoma to come back, but it was almost like I knew better how to handle the treatment and that aspect than to live with that fear hanging over my head. And 
Another thing that I've done, I've really um, connected with other melanoma survivors, which obviously is what we're doing here today. One of the biggest things I think with cancer and melanoma is we feel very alone and connecting with other people that get it and understand and make you feel seen has really helped. It helps you know that your feelings are valid and what you're going through is not abnormal. And then I also joined a support group for AYA survivors. Um, I know we're going to talk a lot more about this later, so I want to make sure that we have time for people to get their questions in. So I'm going to hand off to Star to share her story. Hey there, y'all. Thank you for having me, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I was diagnosed with melanoma uh, back in 2019. I was 31, had never been to the dermatologist before, um, but I had a mole appear on my leg. Um, about six months prior to my diagnosis, but at that time, I kind of brushed it off, uh, unfortunately. So um, six months went by. I was at work one day. I got on Google. I just happened to scratch my leg where that mole had been, and it, it's kind of not in a spot where you can easily see it, so it kind of reminded me that I had that mole there that had never been there before. So at this point, I get on Google. And I'm like looking at all these different images and one of the signs is a new or changing spot. So I start freaking out. I call my mom from work. I'm like, you got to make me a dermatologist appointment. I had never been before. So she's calling around everywhere, trying to find me an appointment. Luckily she did. Um, went there, they removed it. Um, my dermatologist thought it was nothing. Um, and then I got the call a couple days later that I needed to come into their office. And I'm like, they left me a voicemail, like, we need you to come in. We've went ahead and made you an appointment. This point I'm at work and I'm like, it's got to be bad if they're going to make me come in. So called them back. They were able to get me in the next day. Um, and it turns out that it's pretty bad, but they're going to send me to a oncologist, a surgical oncologist. So I went there two days later. Um, he scheduled the surgery the very next day. Um, they did the um, wide local excision and um, the sentinel node biopsy, and it did end up spreading to the two lymph nodes in my groin that they tested. Um, so then I started immunotherapy. Um, I did immunotherapy for uh, 13 months. I was able to tolerate all rounds of the immunotherapy, thankfully. Um, their treatment, thankfully. I didn't have many side effects at all. Um, I had dry mouth, I had itchy skin, and I developed colitis there at the end, but that cleared up at the end with a steroid. Um, I there for a long time, I wasn't too concerned with scans or anything like that. Um, I was just trying to stay positive, um, focus on what I can control versus what I can't control. But this past May, I had a lift node in my arm, under my arm, which was a very distant lift node from where my original site was. And they were like, you know, we want to get this tested. We're going to send you back to your surgical oncologist. So he was on vacation at the time. So this was in May. So finally get an appointment with him in June. And he says, okay, let's do an ultrasound. Went for the ultrasound. He then confirmed, okay, we need to do a biopsy. So we finally scheduled the biopsy. Um, that was pretty scary. They had a needle about this long under my arm. Um, and it took until the end of July to finally get the results that it was nothing, thankfully. But during the course of that two months, trying to find that information out, I went through several different emotions, obviously. Um, one day I would be positive. The next day I would worry myself to death. Um, I just kept reminding myself, focus on what you can control in yourself versus the outcome. Um, 
So it's been been a journey to say the least, um, but it's one that I've met a lot of great people with. Um, I'm happy to be here and be telling my story to everyone and bring awareness to melanoma because it is not something that I knew about before now. I'll hand this over to Catherine. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're good. Okay, I think I have a little bit of a lag still. Can you hear me now? Yes? Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm Catherine. Um, I was diagnosed in March of 2022 with stage 3C melanoma. Um, my story is very similar to STARS. I had never been to the dermatologist before. Um, I had a mole on my arm that had kind of been there you know, my whole life, but it started changing pretty rapidly. Um, so by the time I finally, you know, went and got it checked it out, it had, went and got it checked out, it had probably been a little kind of funny looking for about two months. Um, you know, did the same thing, went in for the wide length excision, and um, it was originally staged as a 2B melanoma. And then after surgery, we discovered that it was actually stage 3C. Um, it was also found, there was also a microsatellite tumor found in my arm and one positive lymph node in my armpit. Um, so those were all removed during the original surgery, but while I was recovering from that first surgery, we also all right, started to notice that a mole on my thigh was changing really quickly. Um, and my surgeon was just like, I don't like the way that looks. We need to get that biopsied as soon as possible. We did, um, and that was ended up being a stage 2B uh, melanoma. So I have been on immunotherapy since um, the end of April, I believe. And same thing, like Star mentioned, I've been so incredibly lucky and tolerating it, you know, really well. I've had a few you know, she had mentioned dry mouth. I didn't even realize that was what I was experiencing that from, but that makes total sense. Um, and obviously just being tired, but, um, and I didn't know what melanoma was. I had no idea. And I still don't even know if I know what it is, but I think I know a little bit more and I know that it's really scary and that it moves really fast. And that's definitely the part that I think is the most terrifying about it. Um, but the people that I've met through all these different support groups and everybody that I've met, I don't know why everybody that has melanoma is cool, but they just are. Um, everybody's just been <laughs> really incredibly just sweet and supportive. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just nice to know that we're all here for each other and here to support each other. So, um, I'll save more of that for later and pass it off to Kelly. Thank you, Catherine. I think we're all cool because we've all been humbled quite a bit through this process. <laughs> and we're really thankful to be here. Um, yeah, so I was um, diagnosed last November. Um, thankfully, my middle son needed to go for a check at the dermatologist. He has a lot of moles. And I was like, well, as long as he's going, I might as well you know, get checked out as well. Thankfully I did. And thankfully I advocated for myself because the um, mold that ended up being um, the most problematic, um, my dermatologist was like, I think it's fine. And I said, I think it's changing. And she's like, I think it's really okay, but if you want me to take it, let's just go. I'm like, just take it. I don't, I don't care about scars. Let's just go ahead and take it. Ended up having two um, melanomas uh, found that day. And so I had surgery um, a week later. I go um, quarterly for checks and I've had to date, um, other than those first two, um, 19 more biopsies sent and two of them have been normal. The rest have been um, precancerous to, you know, different stages. 
Um, I was born anxious, I think. So even like reading the word anxiety, I started to read it a little anxious. <laughs> like, so for me, um, it was really um, from the start uh, a mental battle. And um, thankfully I had a, a trusted therapist who I went to right away and um, asked for some guidance and some help. Um, thankfully, I have a really wonderful support system of friends and family. Um, my best guy friend put all of my, you know, after my diagnosis, I had to go to several specialists to check out and make sure everything else was safe. And like he put all the dates of those appointments in his phone and he texted me ahead of time, which so for if you're here supporting um, a melanoma patient, that meant the world to me. And now I have my group of people, like, you know, before I go in for another appointment, I send out a text, like I'm going tomorrow. And then they always are great to follow up with me after, like, how did it go? And um, that is so meaningful to me. It's so simple and it's so quick, but it has made all the difference for me and not feeling alone in it. Um, so that's been awesome. I've also connected with um, a lot of cool melanoma survivors um, through social media, and it's just so helpful to be able to talk with someone um, who's been there, who gets it, and that I can, you know, send a quick inbox like, I'm really freaking out today, <laughs> or today I feel excited, today I feel hopeful. Um, it's really nice to have, to have that support system. Um, so for me, it's just been like, you know, taking care of myself. I've really gotten into yoga so much so that I decided to teach it, um, to give that gift of meditation, relaxation um, to other to other women. So um, I'm just so thankful to be here and I'm thankful for early detection and um, the opportunity to share my story with you today. So I think Karen, I'm also, I love my mindful coffee time. So I think I'm passing it back to you um, to start off our discussion. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. That was great. Um, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, now I would like to open it up to all of you just for a moment. If you have any questions for each other or any comments on each other's stories or anything you learned from Karen that you'd like to mention before we go into our uh, group Q&A, um, I'd love to give you a moment to discuss all of that. Mm -hmm. Or Karen, if you have any comments or any of the patients, that's also welcome as well. I could just say I'm, you know, super impressed with how, um, you know, everyone here is able to share um, their own experiences. And while there's the commonalities I talked about earlier, um, everyone here is a unique and beautiful person. And so hearing the perspectives, I think, should touch a lot of people out there. And so I'm just grateful, you know, some people might have a hard time coming across in a webinar about things that happened that were so frightening and, you um, you know, I just say kudos to all of you for being here, sharing your experiences and being, you know, so open and kind with, with sharing like this. Thank you. Great. Um, anyone have any other last comments before we move on to our Q&A? Perfect. So I just want to give, again, a big thank you to all of you for sharing your story. And so, as I said, we'll move into our Q&A now. Um, if you haven't already, please ask your questions in the Q&A box, um, and we'll be answering those live. If there are any that we don't get to, um, we will put our email in the chat, and I will be able to answer all of those questions at a later time. So let's see, we do have a few coming in. Uh, so Erica Sullivan is asking, um, with the holiday just around the corner, what advice do you have for being around family members who don't take skin health seriously? Uh, maybe they are still using tanning beds or make comments like it's just skin cancer. And anyone is free to answer that. Um, it's funny because <laughs> I think Erica's talking about my stepdad, um, not intentionally, but um, my, so I actually went to Arizona in, I think it was March, it was March or April with my mom and my stepdad, and 
I mean, I knew that my stepdad loved the sun and stuff like that, but um, I didn't realize how maybe painful or hurtful it was going to be when, you know, so um, I live alone, I'm single. And so especially when I've had these last three melanomas, which have been very recent, I've gone and stayed with my mom and my stepdad afterwards. A lot of mine are on the back where it's hard for me to reach and do wound care and stuff like that. And so he's seen me through a lot of my worst in the last two years. And we get out to Arizona and he goes and lays by the pool. He doesn't have a hat on. He doesn't have a shirt on and he doesn't have sunscreen on. And we're in like Phoenix, Arizona. And my mom and I have had a lot of conversations about it. Um, I mean, at this point, I've kind of had to, I, it, it feels very personal, but I can't take it personal if he's going to watch me go through all that and still not understand the importance of it. There's not a lot that I can do. I know he, I mean, he's in his 70s, so he's like, it's not going to happen to me, which I thought the exact same thing. Um, but it's one of those things we, we control what we can. And we have to let go of the things that we can't control as hard as it is. And I have to put my energy into protecting my own mental health and not trying to change somebody who is not going to until they're ready. But my family gets a lot of sunscreen for Christmas. So <laughs> hopefully he uses some of it. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um... Kevin O'Brien is wondering, would it be possible to hear what having lymph node removal was like? So kind of sharing that experience. I can talk about that. Um, the lymph node removal in my growing, um, it was very close to my sur uh, surgery site on my leg, obviously. So um, it was, it didn't affect me much. I was obviously you know, more cautious, you know, with my movement and what I did with my leg at that time. But um, it was very, very minimal, no pain, nothing like that. It was very comfortable. Um, the lift node biopsy under my arm, um, it wasn't removed, thankfully, because it wasn't anything. But um, the biopsy for that, they numbed it. Um, the worst part was seeing the needle on the ultrasound screen. Um, <laughs> go into your arm. Um, but I had a pretty good experience with my surgery. So wasn't a big deal breaker that I had some lymph nodes removed. Great. Thank you, Star. I was going to say my experience was slightly different. So they removed my lymph nodes when I was under having the actual melanoma removed. And so we had to do lymph node tracing in advance to know which lymph nodes to remove to test. And honestly, the lymph node tracing was probably one of the most painful parts. Mm -hmm. um, you like have to, they inject a dye that burns. The closest thing I can describe it to is like extra painful lidocaine being injected into the area. Um, so it kind of almost feels like that area, it's like a burning sensation sort of as it goes in and then you just have to lay still while it travels until they can take pictures. And then afterwards, the actual recovery overall was definitely, I would say, less uncomfortable than the actual melanoma removal. Yeah, I, I actually, I had the same experience as you, Jennifer. They had to do the, um, you know, it's a little scary too, because you're going into like nuclear medicine, I think is where they put you. Um, shot they do in the areas to the lymph node mapping are definitely uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but I mean, it is what it is. Recovery is not terrible. But uh, the other, the other removal is the fine needle biopsy. I think is that the one Star had. I think it's called a fine needle biopsy. Yeah, that's it. Great, thank you all for sharing. <clears throat> um, Catherine Weller is wondering if anyone has had experience with some people withdrawing from you after cancer diagnosis, um, and would you be able to address that? It's hard uh, to not take it personally. 
I had that happen in my life with someone who was really special to me, and that was really hard. Um, and I just had to give myself space to feel sad about it and talk to my inner circle about how that was painful. And then um, after giving myself space to feel those things, refocusing my energy on all the people who chose to stay, and those people will forever be so special and important to me because they didn't have to, and they still chose to. And so, yeah, and, and I still, I think I have moments where I feel sad about the loss um, or, uh, you know, losing a few people, but the people I've gained or who've really stepped up in new ways um, have brought me so much joy and comfort. And I'm so, so grateful for them. So I try to focus on that. But like um, in the presentation, like Karen said, you know, it's impossible to stay positive and focused on the right things all the time. And that is okay. We just have to be gentle with ourselves. And while I can't say I'm thankful for melanoma, because I definitely am not, I'm thankful for some of the ways um, that I've learned to go about life since, which is very, very gentle to myself first, which has allowed me to be more gentle with other people. But yeah, I think for me, just focusing on when I can, um, all the beautiful people who've stayed, um, that's been really cool. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, Judy Palmer is wondering how you all go through daily life without feeling paranoid. So maybe um, anything you do to kind of help that if those feelings do come up. Oh, do we? Correct, yeah. <laughs> Oh, we do. We do go about not fair. To, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. <they're> <laughs> I was being sarcastic. I was being sarcastic. Uh, yeah. Someone else can answer that one. I was going to say, I definitely have a lot of paranoia. It's, yeah. I yeah. think over time it gets a little bit easier, um, but I've had a lot of feelings of hopelessness because I mean, I was diagnosed in 2015, and since then, I mean, I wear some protective clothing. I avoid peak sun times. I pay attention to the UV index. I wear sunscreen every day. If I am by a pool, I'm the one under the umbrella, and it still came back three times in one year, and you just don't, you know, all you can do is do what you can, and things like this, honestly, have really helped. I've just found ways to redirect my energy and like advocating, educating, those things give me a sense of purpose, which helps outweigh that. It gives that negative energy a different place and turns it into a more positive. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie is wondering, um, kind of in the same vein, how you all deal with maybe any anger you're feeling if those, if that's a different um, route for you. I experienced a lot of anger after my last um, checkup, which was a couple weeks ago. I had a few more biopsies sent and sure enough, they all came back really bizarre. And I just was angry that I'm like, why is, why does this keep happening? And I started questioning so many things and I just did what I've been doing. I just go to my therapist and I go to my people and thankfully I have safe people that I can just admit, like, I'm just angry about this and really got into my yoga practice a lot during those days and just worked on letting go of it over and over and reminding myself, like, it makes so much sense that I'd be angry about this. It makes so much, it makes so much sense that this makes me scared. It makes so much sense that I would feel these ways because of, you know, what it is that I'm battling, that we're all battling. I think just acknowledging that it's okay to be angry or sad or whatever you're feeling. We're probably going to feel a lot of emotions and they're going to change, but they're all valid and they're normal. And sometimes that's the hardest to give yourself some grace over. Great, thank you. Just, I'm sorry, Eric. I was just going to say as a reminder Ooh. too, if you're feeling that the anger and um, just 
feeling very overwhelmed where you're not enjoying anything in your life. You're finding yourself isolated and not interacting. Um, that's, you know, definitely the time to reach out, and not go too far in. So that's when you get to your people, like Kelly said, and, and definitely your oncologist, the nurse, a social worker. If you don't know who that is at your center, asking probably the nurse, asking them, you know, do I have a social worker to speak with? I think is a really good way to start to see if you need or should uh, connect with some of those therapies that we talked about, the cognitive behavioral, the acceptance commitment therapy. These are um, tools for you and they're proven to help um, with the coping. So I just wanna throw that reminder in there too, because it's absolutely normal to feel angry and it's, um, but it doesn't have to be every day and it doesn't have to go on and on. So thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, I know we are running out of time here, but we have uh, one last kind of two questions. Um, have any of you had genetic testing to see if you're susceptible to other cancers, um, or do you have a family history of melanoma? I personally I don't have a family history, and I have not done genetic testing, although that's probably a great idea. <laughs> I've done um, a series of genetic testing, um, a lot of which I'm not entirely sure what it means, um, just because it's pages and pages, but I do know that I do have the BRAF gene um, and that I don't have, it's a DNA, DNA blood, circulate, blood circulating DNA that's found in a lot of melanoma patients. I don't have that. So those are two major ones that are um, determining factors in different treatments. Um, for example, if you're BRAF positive, you have the option of doing targeted therapy. So they kind of like to kind of have you keep it in your back pocket um, in terms of when you're deciding on treatment. But I thought it was a bad thing to be BRAF positive, And I think they say that 50% of all melanoma patients are BRAF positive. I do not have a family history of melanoma. I did have genetic testing earlier this year um, after having the three recurrences so close together. And that was actually a really big source of anxiety for me, which as I was waiting for the results, I was like, oh my gosh, if they're positive, like I'm letting my whole family down and now they're all at risk, which logically makes no sense. Like it wouldn't be me. I'd just be the one that found out, which would actually be helpful if we had it. Um, luckily, I didn't have any genetic mutations. I know my sister's looking into it. We have had quite a bit of cancer in our family in general, but. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, You're getting lots of kudos and love in the chat. Um, so everyone is very, very thankful for you all sharing your experiences today. Um, and so with that, I'd like to move to the closing remarks and really just thank you all again, Karen, Jennifer, Starr, Catherine, and Kelly for being a part of this Ask the Expert session today. I'd also like to thank ESI for their generous support of our Ask the Expert webinar series. Again, this program will be available on demand on our learning platform um, and also streamed to our social media channel soon. Please visit melanoma.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars and other educational opportunities. If you have any questions or you would like to share your story, please email education at melanoma.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us.